And now I'm recording the normal one. Okay, cool. So administrative stuff, assignment four and five are both up. Assignment four is due Sunday currently, and assignment five should be due the next week. I think we have a actual due date, or not due date, but actual date for the first exam. I believe it was October 5th was the week, um, which we don't have class that day. I believe that was a Monday, so it should be the next day, October 6th. Uh, that sounds right. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It is October 5th. October 4th is the day that that is on. So I believe it's it's either October 5th or October 7th. And uh, I'll let you know before the actual exam, but that's two weeks away. Um, just a heads up. So two weeks from today, uh, about, it should be. And again, I think I mentioned it last class, but just in case it wasn't caught on the recording, that is going to be on everything up to virtual functions and abstract functions that we've talked about so far. So pretty much up to the last uh, lecture. And questions, so this will be uploaded on YouTube and WebEx. Yeah, I'm going to try to do both. Uh, I prefer the YouTube one because I would just kind of like, like to keep these public if possible for people to refer to. Um, but... It seems to keep messing up, so I'm just going to try to do both and hope that way, if one messes up, we have the other. Cool. So I think that's about that. Um, I guess we can start getting into actual material. Uh, I had an example today that I wanted to go through, and I wanted to do it as a bit of review for a few things especially the two-dimensional array allocation because that's going to be needed for both assignment four and assignment five and that was one of the things that got cut out in the recording so i i hope it's not too redundant that we're going to kind of refresh on that a little bit um but i think hopefully it will help because you're definitely going to need it for the next two assignments so it definitely couldn't hurt to remind ourselves how to do those things um, but before we do that, let's just talk a little bit about operators and some math stuff. But last class we ended off talking a little bit about the notion of polymorphism when it comes to operators. So remember we talked a little bit about polymorphism last class, which was just kind of like a very broad definition, and it was about there being uh, data taking on multiple forms. Which kind of is apparent just by the word itself, right? Poly means many, and morph means like form, generally. So uh, this is the ability for our data to take on many forms. And so last class we talked about templates where we could have functions take different types and then just have the compiler generate it for us, which we'll do again probably today. And uh, we talked about some other things like operator overloading and uh, the ability for us to use different classes and all that kinds of stuff. So there's a lot of different kinds of polymorphism and we wanted to talk about one more today. So at the very end of class, we talked a little bit about operators and math and how those exhibit some polymorphic traits. Namely, I think we did addition specifically. So hopefully everybody knows how to do this. Um, three plus four gives us seven. And hopefully everybody is also familiar with something like this. So with vectors or matrices, we have the ability to add those as well. and it works kind of like normal addition, but it's technically different because we are like lining these up, right, and then just adding straight across, and we get another thing out that's a vector or a matrix. So vectors and matrices work the exact same way for addition. But there's some like extra implied rules here, namely, um, like you can't add things that are of different dimensions. So these are both two by one, but if I tried to do this, where it was one by three, and then I try to add it to a... 2 by 2 matrix, then that's no good. That's not allowed, right? The dimensions have to match. So um, aside from just like the 
addition of numbers, then there's some implied rules when you do addition of, of vectors, right? Or, or matrices. And so there's some different rules that apply to those that are kind of implied um, that you just kind of keep in the back of your mind. So they, they work similarly, but they, they work differently because there's different aspects to them, right? Um, and then the last thing we could address like a computer science kind of addition that's allowed in C++. So I'm allowed to do something like this, right? Where I can add two strings. And this is nothing like addition in the math sense because while these do have values, we can put them as binary because they're in a computer and just add those. That wouldn't really be something we, we want unless we're doing, I don't know, like encryption or something. Um, this generally concatenates the two strings together, right? So addition in the context of most programming languages between strings is implied to be concatenation, which means that we just put the th two things next to each other, right? So addition can mean different things depending on, on different contexts. And so what we ended with um, in the last class was that they can take different arguments. So this one takes a number and a number. This one takes a vector and a vector, or we could say a matrix and a matrix. And um, this one takes a string and a string, and they return different things. So this one returns a string, this one returns a vector or a matrix, and this one returns a number. Although they don't necessarily have to be of the same type as the thing you're adding or doing the operation one, right? Like for instance, I could do, uh, if, if I did another math operation, I could do like four times a vector, three and six. And then this is, if you remember your algebra, this is just, you multiply four by all the things. So this is a, a scalar or a number times a vector or a matrix and this returns a vector. So we have different kinds of things that we're operating on. So I'm multiplying a scalar and a vector, which are two entirely different things, but we can still have an operation on the two and have something that doesn't necessarily match one of the two arguments, uh, the type of the arguments that is. So when you multiply these, you get a, you get a vector, right? Um, so we want to be able to add this functionality into a programming language with the ability to not only operate on things and define the behavior of them, but also introduce operators that might not be inherently built in. So uh, today we're going to do that with matrices. I've already written most of the code, but we're essentially just going to spend most of the class cleaning it up and kind of going over how you would do that. Uh, I think 90% of the code I've actually written, I haven't gotten a chance to test it yet, so hopefully it works. but. Um, we're just gonna work about cleaning this out. But um, let's just first talk about a matrix. So I could I could do addition and multiplication and all of that between matrices. I won't spend on too much time on how these work, but I assume everybody has a general idea from high school how these work. And so these would like add pairwise and we get a matrix out, right? That's two by two. And so I could add a matrix to a matrix, and I get a matrix. And so let's try to do this in our programming language. But uh, first things first, we would probably need to make a, a class for a matrix, right? That would have a 2D array to store all the numbers in. And this is where we're going to go back to that a multi-dimensional array allocation. I'm going to do it with an array here that's a double array, just as a refresher on how to do it. And plus, in this scenario, I think a dynamic allocation actually kind of makes sense. So we're going to do that that way. And then we would probably just keep some information about the rows and the columns. And then we would want to be able to add these together, right? Um, but if we consider the way that the computer works and like it's built-in operations, addition and subtraction and multiplication and all those kinds of like primitive uh, operations that a computer could do, like simple math operations, then if I did like two matrices that were variables of this class, let's just say matrix M0 and M1, and then I initialized them somehow, then 
if I did M0 plus M1 in my code, that's not really clear what that means yet to the compiler. Because what does it mean to add two class objects? Not super obvious, like we kind of know as humans, right, because of what we've been discussing so far, that, oh, that means to like take the elements in the array and, and add them at the corresponding locations, but uh, it's kind of unclear to the, the compiler, right? Uh, and if I was to expand upon that, like if I just made a person class or something like that, that had whatever inside of it, and then I made two of those, then this operation, especially to both the compiler and to us, is like super unclear. What does that mean to add two people together? Um, you know, does it mean to add their ages or does it mean to like that they have a kid or something? Um, you know, like unclear what it means, right? You can't add two people, but you could totally like come up with a, a way to define how addition between people works, right? You could do either the two examples I gave before. Um, but super unclear to the compiler, especially for that, right, as well as humans. So uh, we need to tell the compiler how to do this stuff. Let's erase this. Um, try not to do anything like that. Generally, you don't want to do operations that aren't super obvious, but there are some exceptions. Just as a, like a programming practice, just as a note. Um, so let's go ahead and try to do that in our code here. Uh, but first things first, let's go ahead and allocate that array. That's the only code I don't think I have implemented. The rest I have as functions. And I have I have another function here I actually need to finish writing. Sorry, one second, let's... I want to read these from a file really quick. Oh, whoops, I already did that. In file.open. Um, so I'm just going to open these files that I have already written. We'll take a look at them in a second. We're just going to do some operations with these matrices. I've written most of the code in advance here. The read func matrix function might already close it for us. No, it doesn't. Okay, never mind. Um, but anyways, we have a matrix class here. And it, like we were saying previously, it's going to have a 2D array of doubles called R here something that keeps track of the rows and the columns, and then some additional functions that basically just do some simple things. Uh, one that allocates the array, which we're going to write ourselves, and this is just going to do the 2D array allocation, and then we have uh, some constructors, and then things that basically do some simple operations here, right? Which I think all these are already written and hopefully should work if I wrote them correctly. Well, let's go ahead and write the code to allocate it, and then we'll just you know, check that all of this works and then try to format it. So first things first with the allocation. Um, so I'll, I'll try to ask you guys first before I, I write all the code. Do you remember what we have to do first when we do dynamic array allocation? And if not, that's okay. We've, I think, only done it once and it is kind of tricky. Okay, fair enough. Um, so I don't see any any clear responses or like answers on how to do it, which is totally fine. It is tricky, and that's why I wanted to refresh it for today because you're going to need it for the next two assignments. Let's say I want to do a 2D array allocation. Let's just draw out a picture first. Pull pointer pointer R. Then remember that when you do dynamic allocation you're only able to allocate one-dimensional strips of memory. So we can't allocate a 2D array, unfortunately, just by doing 
new double this that unfortunately does not work so we're gonna have to do this in basically strips so it, let's just say I had a I don't know three by four array the way we're going to have to do it is rather than have it all be one big table we're going to do it as three rows each containing four things so I'm gonna just underline this really quick that's the rows that's the column and then we have the actual contents of it we do that as green and then the first pointer corresponds to the rows and the second pointer corresponds to the columns now the way we're going to have to do this is we're going to have to separate all of the rows separately because they're each their own allocation right they're going to each be their own single d strip of memory and we're going to keep a set of pointers to these and so you can imagine if I was to join these rows together and just kind of mash them that they would actually look like a 2d array right but we're just gonna to have to keep them separate in our actual implementation so the the actual doubles are going to be in these cells here wherever they are and you can access them once we're done with the allocation exactly like you would any other array but we're going to need to first keep track of where these rows are right so um, first things first I'm going to use red so this is going to be 0 1 2 and 3 and I'm going to make this red here we're going to need to allocate these and remember the way allocation works is that it's going to return a pointer to the memory that was allocated so whenever we allocate these we'll write the code for it in a little bit it's going to allocate these rows and then give us the pointer so what we're going to need to do is store those pointers so that we can keep track of them and so we'll need another array because we could have any number of rows in our array to hold these pointers Oops. Cool. and so we're going to need to allocate this first and then finally that will be enough right because we have all the pointers to our rows and that's good enough and so this will be our our main array and this is kind of like the I probably should have used blue here but this is like the blue dimension this one um, in fact let me just make this blue right so if we follow these pointers we're going to have a pointer to our array of pointers hence the pointer pointer part and that's how we're going to have to do our allocation consider here if I was to access this array like I do any other if I wanted to let's just say get to array element one two then the way I would do it is I would just go to the first entry here in the pointer array and then to the second entry pointed to after that and that's totally what this does here which is how we're used to using an array it says to start at the array pointer which is like the head pointer to our our like table of things that tells us where to go and go to the first one first so follow this path and then go to the second one within that row which is where we want to end up right this is also at one two when it comes to our actual array itself right. so let's just remind ourselves how the code for that works we would need to start with our array pointer and then kind of work our ways outwards right we would need to start with this one and then make that actual array allocation afterwards consider that there's always going to be one array of pointers to our rows so we only need to do one allocation ever for that first dimension and then afterwards we're going to have to do a loop because we need to create some a number of, of rows afterwards so there will only be one loop and I think a point of confusion I was seeing over the weekend from students was uh, you actually really only need one loop for a 2d array you would need two loops for a 3d array so it's always like one less loop than the actual dimension because of the fact that the first dimension is always just a single row 
So let's actually try to code that, which we've done before. So we'll just kind of try to go quickly through it. We are going to allocate the column of pointers. And first things first, let's just make sure that the array isn't already allocated, just in case this is more of a safety thing. Then um, if that's the case, I would want to deallocate it, which I suppose we could also write. We'll write that later if we have time. If not, I'll still put the code up on Canvas because it may still be helpful, but I'm, I'm just going to leave that there for now. We'll allocate that column of pointers first. Consider that that's always going to be the height, right, is what this first one's going to be. It's always going to be the height of our array. We're going to allocate the height first then, which means that R is going to be a new set of double pointers being pointers to the rows and we're going to need height many of them. And then afterwards we'll go ahead and allocate all of the individual rows and then store them in that list of pointers so that we can keep track of where they are. In this case this is where your one loop comes in because you need to loop over how many ever rows you're going to allocate. We'll just do a quick for loop here, i equals zero, i less than height, because we need height many rows, and then i plus plus. And did I forget a semicolon or something? Oh, uh, in, sorry. There we go. And then for each row, we're going to allocate with many long for the row, right? So in each of these rows, there's each with many, in this case, four elements in each row. So we'll need to go ahead and allocate that space. So we'll put that in each entry being r sub i. So like the zeroth row is at r sub zero, the oneth row, first row, is at r sub one, etc and then we'll go ahead and allocate it. In this case, this is our actual array of doubles now. This is where the doubles are actually located, which is why we're allocating just double entries in this case and not double pointer entries. You'll notice that the amount of pointers that you have on like the type that you're allocating with the new keyword is gonna go down once every single time. So whereas our actual array um, is a double pointer pointer, we first allocate double pointers and then doubles after that. So we remove one level every single time. And we're going to, like we said, allocate with many. And that should do that. So that's really hard conceptually, but very easy in the code section here, right? Uh, there's not a whole lot to do. That's just really three lines of code. And we could initialize the array to be all zeros or something like this if we really want to. For efficiency's sake, I'm not going to, but you might have to for assignment four and five. In fact, you should. I think for assignment four, you'll want to initialize your board to all zeros. And for assignment five, you'll want to initialize it to all nulls because it's an array of pointers. Um, but we're just going to leave it for this assignment. I do, I think the allocate or set all the things in that other example on Camus, the game object one, so definitely check that out if you're stuck on setting it, but it's really the same way you would do a normal 2D array. That's uh, Just don't overthink it. Anyways, I think that should do the allocation. And the rest of this is written, so we have a constructor that just takes the rows and the columns and allocates the array, and then another one that reads the things from a file, and then some other ones that print and add and, and do some basic operations. Um, we can hopefully trust that those work. I hope I've written them fine. Um, just as a note here, I've written some matrices, so this is what they look like. Uh, the first one is this one. So it's I have the row and the column at the top. It's going to read three, being how many rows there are. So there's three rows here, and then two telling how many numbers are in each row, so the number of columns. We have this one, it's a three by two. 
this one, which is a 2 by 4, and this one, which is a 3 by 3. So we can multiply some of these together, and we can't add any of them together, so maybe I should make another one um, just for that. Let's add another 3 by 3 one. And we'll save this as four dot matrix. Okay. And then in main here, I just wanted to kind of play around with it. So let's just actually make some notes here, just so this this is easier to read. So it's a three by two, a two by four, and two three by threes. So three by two matrix, two by four matrix, and then two three by three. Let's make sure that all this works and just try it really quick. So, oh, it won't work because I'm, I typed all these wrong. It's, they're called matrix two, three, four. I think this one is called identity three because I made it the identity matrix. And then we'll make a map. Okay. Let's just play around, make sure these work really quick. So I don't know, we'll do matrix three plus, oh, sorry, we have, a, we have an add function, right? It's called add matrix and it's static. Called add matrices, we'll add three and four. I'll have to call mat four. And then let's print that out. Uh, and then I have I give it a stream, and there's a reason I do that. We're just gonna have it print to see out. But I have this matrix function take a stream for both of these and we're going to see why once we do these operator changes but for now let's just print this to see out and then we'll also do one where let's just say we multiply the matrices and we need to multiply these in a specific order so uh, the first matrix and then the second matrix so mat one times mat two Two, and then we'll print that as well. And hopefully you can see that you know this is not intuitive to read, and this is why we're going to learn these operator overloads. Hopefully this works. Let's check. I didn't get a chance to debug this, especially because I didn't have the allocation done. And I wanted to do it in class. Uh, matrices submatrix function must return a value. Oh, that is true. It does have to do that. Oh, yeah, okay. This returns an object. Ideally, I would change this to a pointer, I guess. But I think I'm just going to return a matrix like this. Just use a default constructor. I put error handling just in case we get some bad data or I type something wrong. Now it should compile. I think those are the only issues. There we go. And printing's a little bit off. I maybe need to fix that, but we get a three by three matrix, which is good. That seems to work. If we add this identity matrix to this, we would get what? Two, four, seven, two, six, eight. Two, four, seven, two, six, eight, and then negative three, negative six, negative or er, yeah, negative eight. So the addition definitely works. And then my multiplication seems to be wrong, and I'd have to fix that code. Which maybe I'll do if I have time. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, I'll, I'll maybe fix that later. I, I apparently have some small mistake. Maybe I can fix it really quick. We'll just see.
uh, multiply matrices. So I initialize it and I set it here. Let me just check this really quick. Charles will probably fix the print while we're here. I think it's printing an extra thing at the end. Oh yeah, I do have the, that's fine. So just need to remove this. Okay, and we see that wild printing thing. Uh, it seems to be getting them correctly, just not setting them, which is super weird because the addition function works fine. Unless I made a typo. Multiply, set value, i, j, oh, duh. Um, oh, no, that's right. Oh, that's just not right. I might have to fix this. So I is the rows, and then the columns is the second part. I just don't think I'm setting it correctly. I'll fix it later. I'll think about it. I just don't want to waste everybody's time. Um, but the addition seems to work, and we'll work with that. So let's try to make this a little bit more readable. We have this here now, but like this is not immediately obvious what this does. You have to like sit and think about it a little bit. So let's try to make it look more like a math style notation and clean that up by letting us use the addition symbol. And then we'll clean some other things up as well. So there's a special way to define functions in most programming languages, C++ included. And uh, this allows us to do operator overloading. And I think I'm going to define these all outside here. And so the syntax for this uh, should be the, similar to a normal function. So I'm going to write the addition first. I should be able to write this normally. If it doesn't allow me, I'm going to have to add something extra and kind of explain it here. Let's just say if we want to do addition, we need to consider what addition does. It takes two things, in our case matrices, and adds them together and gives us a third matrix being, or sorry, matrix being our result, which means our return value is a matrix. And then the way that you specify this special type of function is you give the name operator, and then you give the operator that you want to do. In this case, we're going to do addition, so I'm going to put the plus symbol. And then you would just put the argument list uh, like you would for any other thing. So in this case, we're going to take two matrices, matrix M0 and matrix M1. Too many parameters for this operator function. Not true. Is it because it needs to be static? Oh, yes, that would be a thing. Cool. Oh, yes, there are two ways to do this. The, the way I'm doing this right now is not going to work. OK, yeah. So there's two ways to do this. Um, we could do this static. I'm going to do this the first way. And it's going to seem weird. I'm only going to write matrix M1. And then I'm going to go ahead and just copy and paste the add function. And we're going to modify it. I'll explain in more detail why this takes one. But for the time being, let's just make sure it works. Actually, you know what? I could be lazy and just use that.
Um, so we have a matrix returning matrix operator plus it takes a matrix M1. And then I'm just going to do this a really simple way, which is I'm just going to return the result of our add matrices function that we've already written. And I'm just going to have it use this as the first one and M1 as the second one. So this is why this may only be used inside a non-static member. Oh, um, I thought I changed it to be, oh, my bad. I'm going to make this non-static. Should hopefully, oh, uh, and it's a pointer, so I need to dereference it. This should hopefully work. Um, so the, this is the reason why the function is only going to take one operator. And we're going to talk about operator counts in a second. Again, let's just make sure this works really quick. So we will, we'll just write a quick, slightly easier way to do this. Let's say I make a matrix called result, and I'll set it equal to mat, I think it's called identity3 plus mat4, and then I'm going to just print it here. And I need to print it to see out is where I want to print it. And hopefully this should work. And that seems to be the same thing we had before. So now it works. And uh, the point being that this is just way easier to read, like way more intuitive than writing it out the way I did above, which is more of like a programming kind of point of view. Um, so the purpose of these operator overloaders, there's no efficiency, no like technical reason for these. It's really just, it looks nice and it's easy to read. And that's the only reason we use these. You can do any of these that we're about to do with just functions. We're just providing these in programming languages as a way to be able to read your code easier. And that's really all this can do. Hopefully this seems easier to read. Um, any questions before I start talking about the, the whole uh, operator and like operand count? Oh, and I just saw a chat mention. Thank, thank you. Bless you. Okay, fair enough. If you have any questions, just feel free to interrupt me. Let's just talk about the operator count. In programming languages, there are generally three types of built-in functions in terms of count. There are unary operators, there are binary operators, and there's one ternary operator. And these aren't too common. The first two you're probably familiar with just from general math. The third one barely ever shows up. Um, and we could technically say that there's more than this, but they're like user defined and it's a little unclear. Uh, but unary just means that there's one thing, one operand. A binary means that there's two operands. And a ternary means that there's three operands. And by operands, I mean the things being operated on, which sounds overly formal. Don't worry, we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, unary operators include the negation symbol, plus plus, minus minus, and there may be more. Those are the ones that come to mind. I don't think negation works in all versions of C++, but just keep in mind, like normal math, negation is a unary operator. And then binary operators are plus, minus, times, divide these things, and I'm sure some other ones, modulus, pretty much everything that you could possibly think of. And then there's one ternary operator, which we haven't talked about. I'm not sure where I'll bring it up. It's a very strange operator. Maybe we'll just talk about it now since we're talking about these. 
and it looks like this. So let's just address what these mean. So uh, negation, I said, was like an example of unary, and uh, this would be an example of using it. The operator here is this thing, the minus sign, and what that does to a number is it just flips it, right? Um, so you could read this as negative four, potentially, which is fine, but you could also read this as negate the number four. So you have the number four, uh, maybe parentheses makes this more, make more sense. You have the number four and then you negate it and it turns into negative four. In that regard, this is a unary operator because it operates on one single thing, in this case, one number. A binary operator would be something like addition because that operates on two things. So for instance, five plus six, plus is your operator. And then it has two operands. The operands are five and six. So there's two of them. And in the same way, multiplication is like that because there are two numbers that you multiply or two things that you multiply. Same thing with modulus and same thing with the stream operators, the extraction and the insertion, because you always have a location to move it to, like C out or C in, uh, or a place to read it from if it's C in. And then the thing that you want to either send to the stream, like a string that you want to print to C out, that's binary. So this is a binary operator because there's always a left to it being a stream of some kind, an output stream of some kind, and then a string or some other kind of variable that it knows how to print. And then the insertion operator is, or sorry, extraction operator is the same way, right? It usually has like C in or some other kind of stream on the left hand side, like a file, and then on the right hand side, you put a variable that you want to read into. And so those are binary as well, just meaning that they have a like something on the left and something on the right, so there's two things that you write. The ternary operator is a special thing, it's not a math thing, it's just exclusively a programming language thing. And the way you write that is with a Boolean expression. So this takes three things, it's specifically a Boolean expression like, um, let's just say, I don't know, um, you, let's say you have some value, let's say an integer, I don't know, you want to check an, uh, that x is less than 3, or something simple like that. The way you do that with a ternary operator is you put x less than 3 and then a question mark, and then you put two things after it being things that it can return. So, I don't know, we'll put hello and world. Um, so this one's a ternary operator, and it has two parts to it. It has the colon and the question mark. But it takes three operands, a Boolean expression, and then some type of variable, the same type of variable, and its return type is also that same type. Um, if you ever want to use this, it's totally fine. It's actually like pretty good. If you want to make succinct code, this is equivalent to basically writing if x is less than 3, return hello, else return world. It's actually just shorthand essentially for that. So you can use that if you have like a really short if else statement, you can use this ternary statement. It seems really weird and it's like kind of strange to use at first, but like, I don't know, I got used to it and it's super great. Like you can cut these four lines of code down to one constantly and it's great. Um, but that's what that does if you're ever wondering. It's like kind of like a question, it's like is x less than three? If so, first thing, if not, second thing. Um, but anyways, just to bring that up, that's the ternary operator. I think that's the only thing that's not binary or unary in C++, but we have access to these other ones. Um, now there's two different ways that you can use operators when doing an operator overload. You can do it in the way that we just did, or you can do it in the way that I'm going to change it to, to fix it, uh, because I think it's, it's nicer. So consider when you write a, a member of a class. 
we've been doing something like this in actual code, where we add two matrices and then get a third matrix matrix out. Then if I make something a member function, that always means that it has like an instance to called on. Remember that we said there's like you know this object, whatever it is, and then it has all of its members. So in this case it has its own array, which is a pointer pointer, like an array pointer point or integer pointer pointer, and it has a row variable, and it has columns and they're like they're specific to that instance, right? Is the way we said instances work. And it's the same way whenever you call a function, let's just say void plus, let's say the operator plus, uh, actually probably shouldn't return void, should return a matrix. Then the function itself, because an operator is just a special kind of function, always has access to this. And so when I write my function to add two numbers, and I write it as an instance variable. What it will do is let's just say I had my code from earlier where it was something like this, mat1 plus mat2. What this is going to do when you call it this way with a like a non-static kind of implementation, like a, a uh, it, what's the word I'm looking for? An instance function, like an instance member where you have this function belonging to the class, when you write this, it's the equivalent of doing something like mat1.add mat2. It's, it's kind of like a shorthand, right? Uh, so it goes and calls the addition function called plus using mat1 as the calling object and mat2 as the argument to that function. And this is this is if you do it as a... Um, instance implementation, which is what I had right now. So I'm terrible at spelling right now. Implementation. So that's why in my code, and I'm going to fix this. It's probably not intuitive this way, um, so we're going to fix it. But uh, that's why when I wrote my actual addition implementation, when I had it as a member function, so this is like just a function that belongs to the matrix class, then uh, the way it was written is uh, I had to add two matrices together, and the first matrix was this being the calling object, and the second one was always the actual matrix that got called after it. And so that's like, you know, fair enough, we can do that. It's not the most obvious way to implement something because you usually think there's like a left hand side to an addition and a right hand side to an addition so i would say this isn't the most intuitive way to to implement this although you totally can and i usually do because i just like to make things instance members um, but we could also just write these in such a way that that's not the case um, so if we don't want it to be an instance what do we have to do to make it not an instance? Does anybody remember the word for things that don't belong to an instance or but are just like exist on their own and like exist one time? Does anybody remember the word for that? Any any guesses on to like what the keyword was if you want something to exist just one time, kind of like separate from all all instances? Okay, fair enough. Don't see any guesses, but that's all right. Uh, so static things, right, are things that are not belonging to an instance. So in the case of our, our diagram here, we probably don't want to, at least for the sake of readability, tie this addition to a matrix, but just kind of have it be like off here on its own and define addition between two matrices. So we have the option to either just write this statically as like a global function, just leave it outside of any class and just put it there and and make it its own function. Um, and that's really what we're going to do. Or we could mark it as static, um, but that 
doesn't always work with operators, so we're going to avoid that. So we're going to make it static, but we're going to make it static in such a way that we just move it outside the class. Now, I am going to run into a problem here. Uh, let me rewrite this really quick. I'm going to write this to take the two... Oh, whoops. Did that wrong? The two matrices. And then I'm going to, instead of having this add matrix function, I'm actually just going to take all this code and copy and paste it. So let's remove this. Let me make sure I get all the comments. Let's get rid of our add matrix function, or add matrices function, and just replace it with the addition symbol. Um, where did I write this? Here we go. Make sure this is easier to find. Okay, so we'll need to separate this from the matrix class, just make it its own thing. And I'm going to delete the add matrices. Okay. Um, so I'm going to delete this operator overload and just make it its own function that's kind of like separate from the matrix class, just sits here on its own. Uh, so I see a question, what would a static const expression mean? So fair question. I don't exactly know what the const expression keyword means by itself, but uh, a static const expression is one that simplifies to something static. So uh, for instance, if I wanted my class to have the the constant for pi, let's just say, because I need to use that for a bunch of things. Probably not here, but you know, maybe you do. Constant expression pi. Now I don't know the syntax. I know one of the assignments wrote it. I would normally just write it as const rather than const expression. I don't know if there's a difference in C++, honestly. Then I might do something like this. It really just means that the thing is constant and constants by definition are static. C++, being as old as it is, does it in probably a, like a kind of a strange way, um, and the syntax can be like done in a bunch of different ways. I would normally just write const int, and it should, in theory, just do that, the same thing as writing static const expression. So uh, it, I know it looks like daunting when they write it like that, but it really should, in terms of usage, be the same as just writing this like a constant. Um, just it, it all it means is because a, a constant is static, um, it just means that it only exists one time. So it would be very inefficient from a implementation point of view if every single time I made a matrix, it had its own copy of pi because pi is a constant and it should never change. It should always be 3.14. So um, tying that to an instance and making there be a bunch of them is a really bad idea. And that's why... I, I assume it's just for the sake of clarity. People will mark it as static so that you know, hey, this only exists once. We, we only wrote pi one time, all, but all the matrices can see it. Does that kind of make sense? Like why that would be static or like where you would use a static variable? Uh, and it really should just be the same as a const. Okay, sounds good. Um, right, so now we have like this static static add operator, but it's outside of the class. And so you see I'm getting a bunch of red lines here, and uh, I'm getting a red line here as well. No operator. And that's because it's in the CPP here, so I'm going to need to... I'm going to need to move this to this file so that it knows about it. Um, actually, I guess I don't have to. I just need to define it in the other file. I'm going to write this here. Let me write a, a declaration for it. Um, so this was a matrix returning I'm going to fix this in a second, but I'm just going to write it here. And we said it's just operator plus, and then the arguments being matrix M0 and matrix M1. 
So now hopefully this is a little bit easier to read. We are going to define the plus operator to work on two matrices, this one being on the left-hand side of the plus sign and this one being on the right-hand side of the plus sign. But I'm still going to have those red lines and it's going to give me these errors. Does anybody know why or have like a guess as to why I'm getting these errors? You don't have to offer a solution, but like what's the issue with um, with me now writing this plus outside of the matrix class? What happens to my, my variables? I'll kind of scroll over it if it helps. Um... Okay, so it's not in scope. I can technically do that because I have like these variables here, right? So I can access them with the dot operator, right? Assuming I, I have a matrix, I can always access its members using a dot element. Um, so I got a private response and I think it's right. Are columns and rows private members of the matrix class? And you're exactly right. Uh, these are private members. The columns and the row are private variables that belong to the matrix class. And because I've now moved this function outside of the matrix class, I no longer have access to those things. Which means I could write like a get columns and get rows function and grab those. But A, that's a little tedious. And B, maybe I still don't want main to be able to grab the rows and the columns and access those. Uh, but I want this specific plus function to be able to do it. And so uh, if you want to limit that access and allow some things to have access to private variables but not other places, then we can do that with what's called a friend. And I'm going to move this up here. I'm going to do it here. I don't think it needs to be marked under public. I think it can be anywhere, if I remember correctly. Um, one second, I did have a reference for this. I just want to make sure I have the syntax right. It may need to be public. I'm just going to move it there to be safe. I suppose the operator itself should be public. So yeah, I'm going to leave this as public. I want everybody to have access to plus, but I only want one thing to have access to this. And the way you can do that is with the word friend. And now it's gone. We should see that this is fixed now. And it's totally fine. So what a friend function does is it allows you to implement a function outside of the class, but allow it to access private variables. So a friend of the class is able to access private things. It's the one exception to things being private and not being accessible outside of the class. It also has access to protected things as well. It basically just has access to, to everything. I don't know if you mark something as a friend. But that means I also still can't go here and do like result.columns in main. In fact, you'll see that the, the Visual Studio just tells me that's bad already. It doesn't even like give me an auto thing for it. And you'll see it says inaccessible. Sorry if it's a little hard to read, but um, it does say inaccessible and that's because this is private. And now I've made it so that I can use these in a static scope outside of the function, but still limit how uh, they're able to be accessed, and so main still can't access private variables, which is nice. And hopefully we should see now, if I run this, that it should it should just print what we had before. And uh, yeah, it does. So now everybody has access to this plus, and we're able to write it in such a way that it's not an instance variable, and so you can write it so that it takes two arguments, which I think is the way that you would think to do them. The friend functions are like a C++ exclusive thing, I should mention. I think maybe C supports them, but most other languages just don't do that and will automatically infer that you want an operator to be static without you having to jump through all these hoops. But just uh, keep in your mind, when doing C++, the common accepted way to do it is to make something a friend and then implement that friend outside of the class. And because of that, you're never going to put like the matrix colon colon in front of it when you implement it because it's it's not a member of the class. There are some exceptions to that, and let's just talk about some of these these things here. Um, so let's go back to that that list of operators that I had wherever that was. 
We had all these unary operators, these binary ones, and then the one ternary one. I don't know if you can actually operate or overload ternary. And there are some that you can't overload specifically. I didn't put it in this list, but the dot operator is technically a unary operator. I guess it's a binary operator. I actually, I guess I don't really, I don't know. It's kind of hard to clarify. I guess it's, it's a binary operator, but I can always do something like this, right? And then access the things that belong to the matrix. In this case, uh, the dot is an operator. It means to access the things belonging to the, the left-hand side and get the right-hand side thing out of it. You can't overload that one. That one's not allowed. Uh, I think similarly you can't overload this one for the same reason. And there's probably some more that are escaping me right now, but there are a few that you can't overload because um, it would break some things. So can't do those ones. You also can't define your own operators because then it's not clear how to parse them for the compiler. Um, namely, let's just say I wanted to define an operator called A that just meant addition. Then if I wrote this, 3A4, then that's like, what does that mean? That's unclear. Um, from our point of view, we're saying this means 3 plus 4 because we're saying try to make A mean addition, but this could also be like a variable name, right? This is a valid, it's a weird, oh, well, I suppose it's not a valid um, variable name, but if I, you know, somehow put something in front of this, it was like a unary operator that was valid. It could be a variable name as well, potentially, um, or it could mean something else. So you can't make your own operators. It has to be the ones that exist. And some of them have special exceptions. So these ones are unary. That means that you can either make them an instance variable and just have them operator operate on this, or you can make them take a single argument when you write it. The binary ones, we can do the same thing. We can make almost all of these instance variables, except for these two. The, this one and this one cannot be instances. And that has to do with the way that we did the instance implementation earlier. Remember that when we did this one earlier, um, that what it meant was it was calling it like this. And so when it goes and does the add code, this is um, M0. And it allowed us to put like one single operator after this, right? We could put a matrix. Um, so when I when I did it this way, the first argument is always implied to be the calling object. But if I implement the stream operators in that way, so if I wrote my stream operator like this, where I try to print an operator and I overload this one, then the left-hand side is always a stream in this case, right? In this case, see, it, see out. So you can't do this one because the left-hand side can never be the thing that you're printing. It's always the place that you're printing to. Uh, and likewise with the other one going the other way, the thing on the left is always the thing you're reading from, not the instance. And so it doesn't allow you to override these ones as instances. They always have to be friends. 100% of the time, those have to be friends. Um, let me actually just I'll put a note here. These have to be friends. 100% of the time, you have to make those friend functions if you decide to overload the stream operators. Um, you also have access to equal is another one that you can do. And... I feel like there's some more. Oh, uh, plus equal, minus equal, times equal, all those count as well. Divide equal, mod equal are all binary operators. So you can overload any of these. That's totally fine. Uh, generally, I'm going to say try not to do them as the instance implementation. Make them all friends. But we have access to all of these ones. Um, we're going to do the rest of these at some point. I think we'll spend a little bit of the class trying to finish these up. Um, but not all of them are are there. 
I think of particular note, let's talk about the equal operator. We actually probably want to implement that in this case. This one's a little bit weird. And there's like a special operator that comes with it in C++ that's just very strange and gets called in, in a bunch of weird places that you would never have expected to get called. I don't remember the full extent of it. It's really just easier to tell from a debugger um, where this happens. But there's two kind of like things that are able to be done here. Oh, uh, sorry, one, one extra thing before I go on. Um, we're going to do this next class, but this is also technically a unary operator. When you access an array with the indexing operator, then you can override that as well. You'll notice that that's what the vector class does. You're able to access that using the same syntax to use in a, an array, right? You can just put those after a vector and it lets you access things. It's because they've written an operator overload for, for that thing. Uh, but there's these two really weird ones that are binary. So this one's called copy. And then this one's obviously just equal. It's the assignment. They essentially do the same thing. This one sometimes you can explicitly call it, like you can write mat and then that, and it will allow you to call it. But sometimes this also just gets called in like random locations where you would think you would use like an equal. Um, one particular place of note is I think when you return an object, it calls this and it implements it for you by default. But if you write one specifically, it's going to call this instead. There's like a bunch of weird scenarios where it will call it, um, even though you might not expect it to, or you didn't ask it to, it's just going to do it. Uh, so if I make a matrix variable and then return it from a function, it should call this thing when it does the return value. I don't fully know why it does that, um, but it, it does do that. So it's something to be aware of. I'll just, just be careful. I think we'll probably expand upon this in one of the assignments, but um, it's a weird C++ operator and it is very inconsistent when it gets called when it's not. The assignment operator though is sometimes something that you would want to overload. Uh, it's something that's implemented by default. Like obviously I can do matrix M0 and then matrix M1. Like we kind of expect this to work and the compiler will generate an equal overload for you because it's usually kind of like obvious what that means. So this is the one exception to operator overloads where the compiler does have an idea of what you mean. It just means to copy everything over, right? Just, you know, get get all of the values and copy them over. Um, there is one issue with this assignment operator, though, which is why you would overload it. And actually, we would want to overload it for our matrix case would be a, an example of one where you would want to overload this. And specifically, that's when you have pointers. So consider if I just had a matrix, call it M0, it's going to have a double pointer pointer. Called R. And that's going to point to some array in memory. We know it doesn't look like this from the example we did earlier, but it's going to point to it some 2D array, right? And then it's going to have like, let's just say int rows, I don't know, I'm just going to set this equal to three for the sake of our example. And then I might have this one over here, matrix M1, that's uninitialized, but it has its own copy of a pointer to an array and its own number of rows. So when I do this line, what you probably expect to happen and what the compiler is just going to do by default is just going to copy all these values over. So anything that's in the one on the right hand side is just going to get copied into the one on the left. So uh, this one's pretty obvious. That's just going to copy a three there. Um, but what is this, what is this pointer going to do if we just copy the value of the pointer over directly? What is that going to mean?
or why might that might be why might that be an issue if I just copy everything straight over when I'm using pointers? Might not be able to access different parts of data or the array. Um, it's still actually going to be able to access it. I guess it's just the way in which it accesses it. So let's just say I go on to the next line and I go m1 dot set value. And then I set, I don't know, like the first, second position and I set it to three or something like that. What do I expect to happen when I do this? Um, what, I kind of expect it to go to the array and set position one, two equal to three. So I expect it to like go into this, this matrix M1 and go to position one, two, which is right there, and then just put a three there, right? But if I just copy pointers directly, the pointer to this, remember, is a memory allocation or like a memory address. So this array exists somewhere in memory. Let's just say I arbitrarily say that it's at position A, D, I don't know, uh, some random location. Then if this copies values directly over, this is also a pointer to location A, D, which means that this is pointing to the same array that matrix M0, M1 is, which means when I do a set value now on this thing, it's going to go to this 2D array and it's gonna set this position to three, which means it just went over to matrix zero and like got all in its stuff and, and overrode it, which is not good. That's, uh, they're like not separated now, they're pointing to the same thing. And that's just kind of how pointers work, right? They point to locations rather than their own separate things. And so when you have the default equals operator, it's going to copy pointers directly over because that's what pointers are, are uh, address like holders, right? They just hold addresses in them. And so now these have the same address. They're referring to the same memory space. And anything I do to M0 is going to affect M1. And anything I, affect, I do to M1's array is going to affect M0's array because of the same thing. Because of that, if I was to, let's just say, delete M0, a little bit later then now what I've done assuming that this deallocates everything that belongs to it like its array and whatever is I've gone and I've deleted this array and now m1 on top of sharing the array its array is just now gone and now I'm gonna get like a null reference exception if I try to use my matrix like I would um, so we get a we get a ton of issues because they share things in the case of pointers specifically and so um, what you would usually do for a equal overload, and we'll be super brief about it because I know we're running out of time. Um, I'm going to say, this is also a um, thing I see some students do. You can technically make these return anything you want. I'm going to argue that equal and plus equal and all that should return void because equal in itself doesn't really have like an inherent value. Um, I think you can do it differently in C++, which is I'm not a fan of, but if you are if you understand what you're doing, that's fine, I guess. Now, this one you do actually generally do as an instance operator where it takes like one thing. I would say is the common implementation. This is like the one exception. You would normally make this one not a friend and just make it on its own. Is that you would need to for the array in this case, allocate a new array equals new allocation. I'm just gonna write some pseudo code because we're running out of time. You would do some sort of new allocation for a 2D array and then copy the old array over. That way they're they're completely separate. So um, what you might do is is allocate a new array that's like the same size as the one from the source that you're copying from and then just copy all the values over and have this point to there instead 
of the old one. This one. That way they have their own like separate things. We don't have one modifying the other, and they're not like stepping on each other's toes, accessing things that they shouldn't be. There are a few exceptions to this, like if you actually do want them to keep pointing at the same thing. But in general, if you're going to have a pointer member in one of your classes, then you're probably going to want to do an equal overload because you don't want it to copy the pointer directly, and that's that's kind of bad. Um, I want to address one more thing. I'm sorry if I'm going a little bit over. I know we're one minute over already. I just uh, I forgot to bring it up when we were talking about pointers earlier. Let's just say I did integer pointer, x pointer, y pointer, and I did uh, integer x equals 3 and y equals 3, and then I set x pointer equal to the address of x, and then I set y pointer equal to the address of y, then would this be true or false if I checked for if x equals y? Oh, uh, duh. Uh, that, is, that is true. I just I wrote something uh, obvious. My bad. So uh, x, x is equal to y, but what if I wrote x equal pointer equals y pointer? Is that true or false? Yeah, I see a false. Um, any reason why that might be false? Because they are both 3, right? So maybe it works. Ah, and you got it. Perfect. Uh, and it is private, so sorry if everybody can't see it, but um, uh, August correctly answered um, that this is false because the addresses are different. So consider when you're comparing pointers, you're comparing addresses, not values. So even though x is 3 and y is 3, these are these are comparing the addresses of two things. So just be careful when you're doing equals between pointers. The same thing applies when you're doing like members. So uh, we'll do an op equal equal op operator overload probably in the next class. But we don't want to use the default one because it's going to compare the addresses of the thing, like pointers, rather than um, compare the values of classes. And same thing with any other, any other type. Uh, so sorry for going a bit over. I just remembered that at last minute. But we'll finish doing the rest of these operator overloads, and I'll try to fix up the multiplication by next time. And I will stick around if anybody has any questions. And uh, I will see you guys on Thursday. Have a good one.